this morning is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So far, text. Dear Christian friends, the letter to the Ephesians ends in our text. There's still a little bit after, as he does some final greetings, but the text begins with finally. This is the last section of a letter to the ancient Christian in Ephesus. And with these words, he encourages them. He calls them to defend themselves. And they go on the offense just a little bit too with God's word. We go forward under the theme, Soldiers of the Cross. Know your enemy, put on your armor, and stand your ground. We're going to skip the verse, the first verse, just for now. We're going to come back to it. I want to go straight to verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. What I want to focus on here is just the devil's schemes. And in 2021, I think that the devil's greatest scheme is that he he doesn't exist. There aren't really any new studies, but if you go back to 2009, you'll see, I don't know if you can read that on the screen, most American Christians do not believe in Satan or the Holy Spirit. Well, they're equal opportunity Christians out there. That's 68% 12 years ago of American Christians, self-identified, don't believe in the spiritual at all, including the devil. Now, I don't think life has gotten any more crystallized for those Christians as the years have gone by, especially with the rise of the nuns, if you're familiar with that concept. How when you poll many Americans today, they don't poll themselves as Christian or Catholic or Presbyterian or whatever. They're just nuns. They don't hate religion. They just don't identify with it. They're so far removed from it. The rise of the nuns, as it's been called. That scheme is working pretty well for the, for the devil. Because honestly, if you don't know that the enemy who is about to attack you is there, that's catastrophic. You have no chance of defense. And that's where so much of America stands right now. And in all honesty, I'm not sure how America, I, I have not said this for a long time, can call itself a Christian nation even if you have self-identified Christians, if you deny any kind of spiritual, what are you doing, Christian? Like, what are you just the Lions Club that does nice things in the world? I mean, that's okay, I guess, but you're not Christian. Well, we keep moving. The Apostle Paul takes us to verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I I want you to understand exactly who Paul is talking about in these verses and who he's not. He's not talking about the bully at your school who's mean to you. Although the devil can be behind that. 
he's not talking about the guy who just cuts you off on your daily commute. The devil could be behind that too. He's not behind your spouse who is there to encourage you and to pray for you. But it might look that way. Those are all ways that the devil might influence you. But what Paul's trying to impress on you, Christian, is that these are spiritual problems. Paul starts out, and the order of the Greek language is blood and flesh, which might not roll off the tongue. That's not how we normally read it in the English language, but it was striking to me. And for all of those of you who would agree with Velma that there's no such thing as ghosts, your God would agree. But we're not talking about ghosts. We're talking about angels. These are the bad ones. They're also known as demons. These are spiritual beings who are real, and they are extremely dangerous. You need to be concerned. That's why Paul spends time as the last thing he wants to tell these people, listen up, there's ranks. We know the name of the guy who's in charge of all of them, Satan. Your Hebrew says that is, means accuser. That's his main job. He is the most vicious prosecuting attorney the world's ever seen because he relentlessly takes actions that you have done over the course of your whole life and then one after another bombards you whispers hateful things in your ear and they're all lies that's who he is of these demons there are ruling ones like satan there are ones that are a little bit under the attacking ones and they're the ones that just cause mayhem that's kind of the breakdown that we have in this verse, and it's not pretty. If you go back to Ephesians 1, you hear the Apostle Paul give him a different name, the ruler of the kingdom of the, of the air, the spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient. This is who you are up against. These are spiritual problems. And for this, God says, be vigilant. So soldiers of the cross, you know your enemy. You know who this guy is, so let's put on the armor of God. This is verses 14 through 17. It's a very well-known chunk of scripture. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted for the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That's quite the complete picture, isn't it? And there are some people who have mused, is the Apostle Paul looking at the guard who's standing right next to his cell as he's chained to the wall, and he's dictating this, and some scribe is writing down the words that he's speaking? Maybe. You have to understand that the Roman legionnaire was the highest form of technology the world had ever seen. No army stood up to Rome, period. They stomped all over everybody. And Paul breaks it down. Why? This is the belt. We're not talking about the belt that I'm wearing to keep my pants up. This is more guarding everything lower, groin down. It was more of an elaborate belt. It covered everything. And a lot of times you see it more like a skirt, but it's made of leather. And the point is, if somebody tried to stab you down there, it didn't just go straight through. It was usually deflected or you could block it. The belt of truth is incredible because that's what everything is based on that truth of god is what you hang your hat on when you wake up it is the most basic defense that you have when jesus says that my word is truth he's not just saying it's not a lie he's saying this is the basis for all truth ever anywhere you start with what your god says in the bible and then you go from there Moving on, we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. This is a righteousness that's different from what the world has. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 3. It's not like the one that comes from the law. This comes from God. It's given to you. It's not something that you produce in yourself. This is a gift of God. And so when all of those blows come to you, you are right before your God because of what Jesus has done. The sandals, you might think, well, that's kind of crazy. Why would you want footwear? 
Don't they have better stuff? Well, I think there's something to be said for you can be fully armored or you can just be quick and not get hit. And that's exactly what we talk about here. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And there's kind of a paradox here, isn't there? The gospel of peace that equips you for spiritual battle. You're ready with whatever comes your way. And so much of what you come across, Christian, can just be deflected and diffused. You don't have to respond in kind. Because you can be a peacemaker. And you can sling that gospel around everywhere you want. You don't have to be choosy about it. With a reckless abandon, you can tell anybody who's vertical and taking nourishment, your God loves you. Next is this shield. This, there has been a lot written about shields. And if you do a little bit of research, this is the scutum, S-C-U-T-U-M. Um, shield technology kind of reached its pinnacle here with the Romans. You could hide behind it if you crouched down a little bit. And I think Paul had enough understanding of how the Roman legions functioned that he said he was not kidding when he said that you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. That was the purpose of it. It wasn't that heavy. It was lightweight, and the arrow would kind of go through, but it wouldn't go through you too. So you'd see these people walk around with all kinds of arrows sticking out of their shield. That's what it was for. It was just to deflect those blows. And so this shield of faith, taking the metaphor along with it, faith is what you use to receive everything from your God. It's a gift from him that he creates in you. And you receive salvation, the forgiveness of sins. It is in faith that you pray. It's in faith that one day you will close your eyes and wake up in glory. What flaming arrow of attack from the evil one can get through that shield? What's faith? Nothing. Now, the Christian does not hide behind the shield, and I did miss the next picture, which would be a helmet, but you've got to stick your head up once in a while, Christian, and look around and go on the offensive. And that brings us to the next one, the sword. The sword of the Spirit. And Paul goes on, or the author to the Hebrews, we don't exactly know who that author is. This sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It divides soul joint marrow it goes straight down into the heart i never have to wonder if i'm reaching people because it's not my job god's spirit goes with his word is what makes his word so dangerous and i've seen people in a very real way get scared when i talk to them about who their god is and what he's done and they say wait a minute something is happening inside of me and i don't like it that's disappointing to see. And yet as someone who wields God's sword of the Spirit professionally, it's fun. Because God really does change hearts through his word. And you don't have to have pastor in front of your name to wield that sword either. All of you do the same thing. As you season your speech with the salt of his word. Go out in social media. Go out at the soccer game as you watch your kids play. And use God's word to change those hearts. Because you can. And that's what God has charged you to do. Finally, I didn't really have a good one, but I, th these next few verses are really awesome. Verses 18 and then 19. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. People talk about the battle cry of the Christian as prayer. I would never heard that until I was reading a commentary on these words, and that's beautiful. Because so often the prayer is said silently. So often all these battles that Paul's talking about are spiritual ones. They're temptations that happen in your mind and in your soul. And that battle cry of the Christian, when you are facing that temptation, you can call out to your God for help. Because you're not alone. Soldiers of the cross, know your enemy, put on your armor, and now stand your ground. And this is where I want to go back to the first verse. The first verse says, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. That is a beautiful verse. It is passive. The concept of a passive verb is that you don't do it. It just happens to you. 
if you type into a word processor a bunch of passive phrases, they flag it because that's bad English. Or if something happens, you could say, well, someone broke this vase, but I'm going to clean it up. That's not a good way to go through life. You can actually take ownership for the things that you do wrong. But here, God's trying to impress on you, you're not the one doing this. There's a, a translation that is not well known, but they did a really good job with this verse. Let the Lord and his mighty power make you strong. It gets the whole point across. It makes it active. But what is accomplished there is God's the one doing this. He clothes you. He forgave you. He died for you. That's at the root of all of this. That is what is understood. That you are strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Because you are that way because God makes you strong. And now... Verse 13 is the final verse we're going to look at. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. It's kind of redundant, Paul, isn't it? But let's talk about what the evil is before we talk about the standing. Is the day of evil the day that you die? I don't think so, not necessarily. What about the last day when God ends it all? When you stand before the judge of the world? I don't think that's what he's talking about either. I think he's talking about something very specific. I want to take you to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, you hear Paul kind of bare his soul as he's attacked. And he talks about what life is really like for him. He says, starting in in verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I think the day of evil is any day, and I don't think it's every day. Do you know what a bad day is, Christian? (laughs) So I flew up, I drove up, and I flew home when I dropped off Luke at college last week. And somebody in the Bible class reminded me that that was just a week ago Saturday that I was on an airplane and in a coach bus and in an airport, I don't know, few hundred people at least. I don't want to say thousands. So who knows what you were exposed to in that time. Well, I sounded like this all week, and my wife's like, are you sick? I'm like, I'm not sick. I feel fine. I've been eating. I have not lost my appetite. I don't think I have a fever. But yesterday, I woke up with a sore throat. And so she did a great job. Jenna found me a place, the nearest place to get a COVID test on a weekend, which is Mount Airy. So you get in your car, and you drive to Mount Airy, and then you're driving there, and then right around King, the back tire sounds like it's about to fall off and you pull off on the exit right by the Schneiders and sure enough there's a hole as big as my thumbnail in my tire. I'm like, what the? So I changed the tire, I still know how to do that. And I made it to my appointment and she goes, well, we'll get your test result back to you in four days. I said, well, that's useless, <laughs> four days? So it's supposed to be 24 hours. She goes, yeah, but everything's backed up. Okay, so you drive home. So. To me, a day of evil is any place where you are attacked and you have just the hint of temptation to say, does my God love me? These are the spiritual attacks. That's why that bully at school is not what we're talking about. That guy who cut you off is not what we're talking about. All of those do, though, pile up, do they not? So you Christians start to go, man, God, what's wrong here? There's nothing wrong with your God. That is a spiritual attack from the devil. Because he's trying to get at you. And when you look at the armor of God, don't see it as piecemeal. Well, I need to put on the belt tighter, or the righteousness isn't quite fitting my breastplate. That's not what you're after. It's this one complete picture. Okay, It's a unit. It is. Those all go together so that you can resist. Because I don't doubt that my God loves me. But as I took off all the nuts in the tire, and then I can't get it off, I ended up kicking it six times, and it did come off finally. I thought, I don't even know what I'm going to do. Finally, you call a mechanic, right, or a tow truck or something. But it was fine. Because your God will see you through all of these temptations. But once in a while, you have to stand firm. And understand that your God has not left you. 
and trust in his promises because they're unbreakable. But that's hard to get to sometimes. I know this. I haven't been sick since December of 2019. I've been blessed with incredible health. This is the first time I've had a sore throat. And that's it. And that doesn't mean that God's left me, obviously. People have gone through far worse. God is still with them, of course, too. Be aware, soldiers of the cross. Know your enemy. Put on your armor. Allow God to clothe you in his word and all of his promises. And stand your ground. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and